Hello, everybody. This is James Dean with Daily Effects. Just wanted to say thank you very much for your time in advance. So we are in the week after NFP FOMC, and we started to see a pretty strong U.S. dollar. Uh, there was a a driver of interest earlier this morning, although that USD bump is likely more related to oversold conditions coming into the month of November. But as usual, I'm going to look on both sides of the matter. I think there's a couple of setups interesting for dollar strength. And there's a couple of setups interesting for dollar weakness. I'm going to look at all of those today. But as usual, this webinar is all about you, ladies and gentlemen. So setups you have, pairs you want to take a look at, feel free to send those my way. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, need to show you this risk disclaimer first and foremost. I'm going to leave that up for about 10 seconds, and then we'll move on to the live charts. Uh, but like I said, fire anything trading or market related my way that uh, you might have some questions on i'll do my absolute best to help all right let's make this happen all right so as mentioned we are seeing a strong i say a relatively strong uh, us dollar so far today as price action has jumped right back into that resistance zone that we've been following that runs between 9786 9794. So this is a confluent zone that I have comprised of two different Fibonacci levels of interest. Uh, let me go back here to the daily so I can show you from where those levels come. Uh, first and foremost, that 9786 level comes from this Fibonacci study. Taking the swing high from December of 2016, drawing that down to the February 2018 swing low. And notice that level comes in right there. Drawing back a little bit further than that, if we go to the 2014 swing low, draw that up to the 2016, 2017 swing high. Notice that one is in green. There we go. 97.86 up to 97.94. Now, when we go down to the four hour chart, you can see those two levels very visibly. 97.94 is the 23.6 of that longer term move. 97.86 is the 618 of that shorter term move. Going a bit closer, there you go. You can see where we had this very one-sided run, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. As price action burst up, retest this 98 level. We haven't since, or buyers haven't since been able to break through. But this does keep a number of items of interest on the short side of the U.S. dollar. In essence, trying to play a top side or trying to react to that recent swing fading off this recent burst of strength looking for prices to meander back down below this longer term resistance zone now with that being said if we go down on a short-term chart there's been a lot of aggression in this move this indicates that there's probably at least some short cover taking place but notice that we are seeing some follow-through support and again this is a very short-term basis but we have already seen some follow-through support up around these highs indicating that buyers are still on the sidelines still ready willing and able to hit that bid and this is something that could support a deeper move up towards like a 98.35 to 98.50 type of area now longer term bigger picture i'm still a usd bear largely on the basis of that rising wedge break that played through in q4 rising wedge mentioned is here and it uh is derived from a longer term study i'm on a daily chart it'll probably look a bit better here on the weekly there we go and you can see where that rising wedge had formed for the past couple of years. Fresh two-year high on the first trading day of Q4. October brought the bears into the mix. Last week had an extension of that bearish run around FOMC, NFP. So far this week, it looks as though, and like I was saying a little earlier, it feels as though this is a corrective type of bounce, which puts so much emphasis on that 98 level. But as I mentioned, I think there's a couple of setups that are attractive on either side of this matter. So let's start parsing through those. Okay, going along with this morning's USD strength, we have a really big move of weakness here in the Euro dollar. Uh, I personally feel like this is a trap. I want to be very, very careful of triggering any new positions at this price as I can make a strong justification for both bearish breakout potential uh, as well as bullish swings. Uh, so for now, I'm going to keep this off my radar, but a couple of different things can happen to clean this up. Let me go out to the four-hour chart, and we can start from there. Okay. Now, as we looked at last week, prices had postured just below this longer-term resistance zone. I have it between 111.87 and 112.12. And this is something that's been in play in varying ways for almost a year now. 
it was last November when the euro was in a stark one-sided run, finding support just a few pips north of that 112.12 Fibonacci level. By March, we were finally able to penetrate, albeit slightly, only for follow-through support to show at that 1187 level. Pretty quick catapult right back up to 114.48, another Fibonacci level of interest. A bit of gyration developed coming into the summer. Notice a bit of resistance began to show, follow-through support began to show again. It wasn't until August when we had this big collection of roughly equalized price action over a little over a week that resistance finally set in off of that zone before the pair perched down to fresh lows. Now, more recently, as we've seen that 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 reversal develop in the U.S. dollar in Q4, Euro dollar caught a strong topside bid, made a very valiant run towards that longer-term resistance zone. But again, buyers pulled up very, very close, very, very shy before a retest could come into play. Now, last week's FOMC NFP saw this thing catapult right back up. That's the FOMC wick right there. Super so prices initially dipped down to 1082, that support level we had previously looked at. And then like a slingshot or a catapult right back up towards those highs. But again, another iteration of lower highs, shy of that longer term resistance zone. This has started to come unwound earlier today. Um, now, on the driver side of the matter, we did have Christine Lagarde's first speech as the head of the ECB take place last night. I guess it was yesterday in the States, last night in Europe. And it really seems as though she's going to use her political skill set to try to urge some fiscal responsibility here. If, uh, let me take a step back. Responsibility is a very biased term. Some fiscal encouragement from the various um, uh, economies within the Eurozone to work on that next aim or strategy of stimulus, as opposed to just relying on the ECB to keep driving rates even more negative. Now, as I mentioned, there's a case to be made on another side here. On the breakout side, uh, notice where we had these swing lows that had set in in the final week of October. Well, we just barely breached below those, but you can see where there was some pretty intense selling pressure as prices came down. Like you can even see where buyers are trying to jump in off of that level. But at, that's, at that point, sellers just continued to outnumber them, driving lower, driving lower, driving lower. Now we're roughly equalized. This is something that could support a quick pullback to a lower high area of resistance for bearish continuation tra uh, strategies, bearish trend strategies, etc. Uh, I'm very cautious of that because there's another Fibonacci level of interest that's helping to mark these lows. You can see this right here. It's very simply the 50 fib of the August to October major move. Get down on like an hourly chart and you can see that is what is helping to bring buyers into the mix. I think there's also a conundrum here from a risk reward standpoint. Let me just go back to the four hour chart and we can explore that in depth. 11010, major psychological level. Pretty nearby as well. Let me just get that right at the 110 marker. I'm a stickler for details. And 10994 is not the same as 110. There we go, 110. We have that big psychological level lurking just underneath. And so for me, this is something that caps top end profit target potential. I don't want to look for profit targets too far beyond that psychological level because I think if we get down there, it's at the very least going to give a pause to price action. That is just about 65 to 70 pips away. This recent swing high at 111.76, that's greater than 100 pips stop. So the risk reward simply isn't there for short side breakout or excuse me, for short side trend strategies yet. Now what could bring that back is a pullback to find resistance at the 618 around 111.08. And if you remember, that was a key price that we had previously looked at, 111.09, same vicinity. essentially generated from that swing high in mid-September, a pullback to that level, that could get that risk-reward paradigm a little bit more attractive. Where I could look at stops above the swing high, and I could factor that to a greater than 1-1 on a retest of the 110 figure. Likely even a couple of areas that I could pick off for scales or break-even stops on the way back down. So it could set up, but from where I'm at right now, it's not a lot of not a lot of motive to take on risk and trying to guess which direction this thing's going to move next. Uh, a case on the bearish breakout side, there's a case, uh, case on the bullish swing side. 
think it really just depends on one's bias on either the euro or the U.S. dollar. And for my money, there's more attractive venues elsewhere. I see one question coming in on one of them already, dollar Swiss. That's definitely something we're going to look at today. I um, want to run through a few additional pairs first. So before we move on to the next one, I just want to kind of reemphasize the move that's taken place over the past, well, so far this week, shall we say, from that swing high all the way down to a fresh three-week low. Now, if we steer that view over to cable... This pullback has been far more moderate, indicating that as we have seen prices pulling back, we've also seen some bulls on the sidelines coming in to pick up exposure, taking advantage of that run of USD strength. And this is helping cable to hold above those swing lows that came in right around FOMC. I'm keeping this one on the long side of the radar, one of the more attractive short side USD candidates at the moment to my eyes. All right, there we go. Uh, we had that bull flag from last week. Price action just tiptoed outside of that formation. I was looking for support around this area. Hasn't yet held. But again, we haven't really seen sellers go for the jugular, similar to what we've seen in euro dollars. Prices are breaking down. So if we do see that USD weakness come back off of that resistance, we were looking at it on the DXY chart, in essence, looking to play that for swings. I think this is one of the more attractive setups that's available on charts right now. Uh, so while we're here, I think it's worthy of investigating as to why this USD streak has come in today. Um, so this was a market alert written by my colleague, Mr. Thomas Westwater, a little earlier this morning. USD spikes, gold sinks as ISM services PMI tops estimates. So this is something that we've talked about a little bit more on these webinars of recent. I generally won't get into the... I don't want to call it a smaller data print, but these itemized prints, let's say that. Um, but what happened last month is noteworthy, and I think that gives some scope to what we're seeing right now. That print last month, I believe, was October 3rd, the day that it came out. And it was like the U.S. dollar was already on the ropes at the time. We had just gotten manufacturing ISM, which continued to disappoint. But once services ISM came in disappointing, it was like, okay, well now manufacturing and the services sector in the US is both under, they're both under fire. It's going to put the Fed in a tough spot. Got a lower low, led into a lower high. And then this thing just continued to tip over for the rest of the month or at least the next couple of weeks. Well, that's one of the things playing in so far today. We had another one of those ISM services, uh, those service ISM releases. It's not populating right now for some reason. But we had another one of those services ISM releases. This one came out better than expected. And that explains as to why we're seeing some short cover in that previously bearish theme in the U.S. dollar. You can even see where that resistance level is trying to hold the highs right now. It's even more motive for top side swings or uh, for short side swings off of that resistance. All right, but going back to cable. This one remains as one of the more attractive candidates to try to take advantage of that, that quick USD spike that we've seen so far today. The problem here is going to be one of longer term target potential, because if we take a step back, there's very rational reason, reasonable reason, <laughs> reasonable explanation as to why uh, that top side trend has been stopped dead in its tracks. It's the 130 big fig. One of those levels that doesn't come into play very often, but if you look at the way the 120 helped to cauterize support in the pair August, September, when things were so dire and nasty around Brexit, I think we're seeing a similar type of effect off that 130 spot. And I think the best way to, to imagine this is the price of 130.01 seems a lot more expensive, much more than two pips more expensive than 129.99. And sure, like many other technical methods, you could argue as to why it's not that important or why there's better support and resistance mechanisms. But there's a reason that every major retailer on the planet Earth utilizes a similar strategy. Well, most major retailers, at least, of pricing items in increments of 99 cents. Because that extra two cents to put it over the hump of uh, the psychological threshold feels a lot more expensive than just two cents or two pips in this case. Uh, sure enough, prices ran up towards that 130 level, buyer shied away. We even encroached upon it a few weeks ago, buyers shied away yet again. Uh, this most recent topside run, buyers weren't even willing to test up to that level. Notice they stopped short, 29.75.
So for initial profit targets, at least, I want to factor that a bit more modestly. I want to look for around 29.50, after which a 29.70 print. And then I could look for that 130 big figure. Now, if that 130 comes into play, in essence, I have to play with breakout logic. If we get up to that point of resistance that previously turned around a real strong topside advance, I want stop to break even. I want to be scaled out of the position, and I want to be ready for this to show me another false breakout. And if it doesn't, great, even better. But I want to gear expectations very, very low in case we end up with another iteration of what happened just a few weeks ago. All right, let's flip, let's flip the script. Let's look at the long side of the U.S. dollar. And this is what I've been following for a while. We had an RBA rate decision last night. Uh, RBA did not cut rates. They didn't even really sound that dovish. They are looking for inflation to come in at the lower end, but I think they're looking like 1.8%, which relatively speaking, isn't that bad for right now. Uh, my motive here is largely technical in nature. If we draw back to the beginning of last year, this thing has pretty much been in a downtrend for most of that time. There's been a couple of periods of retracement or pullback, but by and large, uh, we've been in a directional move ever since 81 came into play. Now, in early August, we saw fresh decade lows print right around that 67 handle. And that's proven to be a tough nut to crack. Multiple iterations throughout August, and again in September, again in October, as yet, sellers have not been able to leave the zone behind. Uh, as we had that retracement develop in the US dollar coming into Q4, similar type of retracement developed here in the Aussie. Prices moved up, eventually found resistance off this trend line projection that could be found by taking the swing high from December of 2018 to April of 2019, We've did a great job of catching the highs in July. Let's come back into play now. And you can see over the past four trading days, we've had three of those days test at or around the trend line, uh, including last night's RBA. Remember, last night's RBA, not as dovish as expected. Prices burst up, retest of the trend line, not able to take it out. Resistance holds, prices have flexed right back down. And if looking for long USD strategies, if looking for the dollar to break through that resistance is currently showing, I think this is gonna be one of the more attractive setups on the radar. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, one, not only do we have this trend line projection, but going back to a risk reward paradigm, even if prices do break out, punch up to fresh highs, there's another really big level lurking just very nearby. That's the 70, uh, the 70 handle. A major psychological level. Again, very similar to 130 in cable, parity in Swissy. Even if we are able to break out after these three of the past four days showing resistance off that trend line projection, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of room for it to run. Um, so I'm keeping this one on the long side of the radar. In essence, just continuing to play short side swings in the pair until it shows me something to reverse that course to reverse that stance. Uh, now on the profit target side of the equation, that very obvious level is right around 68.10, 68.15. I don't wanna get so greedy just because that's such a clear and obvious level that's out there. I wanna go a little bit tighter and I wanna look at something like 68.50 to 68 and a third for that initial target. Secondary targets could be sought out around that area that may have a trap in it around 68.10. 67.50 on the way down, after which, similar to what I would look to do in cable, looking to play that breakout logic after entering as a trend-based type of setup, uh, stop to break even, and then look for the big hitter on the last piece of the lot, seeing if sellers could finally leave that 67 zone behind for now. It's been a persistent little area of support so far. But sellers don't look too disengaged as of yet. All right, dollar CAD. Okay, so again, drawing back to that example that we looked at in the US dollar is USD's pushing up to those fresh three week highs. Looking for short sets, in essence, becomes a game of deduction. Uh, which of these counterparties is showing the most promise, the most strength that could be worked with? on those USD reversal setups. I still like dollar CAD to the short side. Um, as we looked at last week, there was BOC right ahead of FOMC. That gave a quick run up to test above 32. As that USD weakness came in after FOMC, prices dipped right back down, found support in that big picture zone, 31.32 to 31.50. 
We had a lower high coming to play on Friday. Another support test coming into this week. Now we have this, this, this spurt of USD strength. We have another lower high or a potential another lower high playing in right now. So again, for short side USD swings, looking to react off that level of, or zone of resistance in DXY, I think this one's still pretty attractive. It does have somewhat of a, a, a cable conundrum at the moment, which is on the top end or brute force profit target potential. As in, we saw buyers shy away from a 130 retest in mid-July. We saw a similar type of thing go down just last week. Remember, prices ahead of BOC were heading in one direction. And we came like 30 pips away from retesting that July low. Now, if we take out that, that July low at this point, we have fresh yearly lows on dollar cat. But I don't want to look for profit targets too far beyond that 130 big fig. Because sellers have been so reticent to test below that so far and have no evidence to indicate that anything there has changed. Unless we get some massive breakdown in the US dollar, it's hard for me to get really excited for a 130 retest or even a test below that level. So initial profit targets are gonna be a bit more modest. I'm gonna to try to pick off of this quick little swing high around the 131 figure. Secondary targets around 130.65. Tertiary targets at that July low, just around 30.15, call it 30 and a quarter, be on the safe side. At which point I could then similarly stop to break even, look to play breakdown logic on the remainder of the lot on the final scale of that position. So that if we do get something that slaloms below the big, uh, the big figure of support, well, then at least I, I still have something that could play. But if we don't, we end up with a false breakout and a snapback, stopped out on a trailed stop or at the very worst, my uh, original or initial entry price. Don't want to leave too much exposed risk on with something like that. All right, back on the long side of the dollar, and admittedly, this wasn't a setup that I was extremely excited about last week, but the logic was there, the deduction was there, and so far it's played out pretty well. And in essence, I was looking at that 98.50 support in dollar Swiss. Let's cut that back to... We'll just keep it on that one. So look at that 98.50 support on dollar Swiss. And there was a couple of different things going on at the time. Um, when we had looked at this, yeah, it was 1031. So prices hadn't yet encountered 98.50. But this was a support zone that held the lows through multiple iterations in the past couple of months. Um, perhaps more importantly than that, the fundamentals appeared to be at favor here. The Swiss National Bank had just previously said or threatened um, the prospect of intervention, in which case would be franc weakness if the SMB is actually doing anything. Now, I don't think that they've done anything here, but I think that simple tacit threat has been enough to help lift the pair off of support as it's in essence staying within a range formation. It's getting to a tougher spot to plot for topside as this 99.50 area has had a pinch for showing resistance of recent. Just beyond that at the parity figure, that's gonna be a very, very tough level to plot for tar profit targets above. So at this stage, about the best that I have is looking to play a pullback to that 99.02 Fibonacci level. Not the first time that's been in play. And then looking for that to run up towards that 99.50 figure. Now, if that happens, there might be a stop and reverse in my near future. Stop and reverse is in close out the remainder of the long, look for a short, and then in essence try to play mean reversion or continued mean reversion in the pair. But it's not what I have for right now. Uh, right now, it's been a strong, clean, one-sided trend. Pull back to support, play it up to resistance. It's the next order of the day, at least until something shifts or changes on that front. One last dollar pair before we move on. It's a pair that's put in some pretty decent volatility so far today. Dollar yuan. So this is a, a very unique level. It's the uh, another big figure, a psychological level at uh, seven flat. Now, if you remember, I had used this level to leg into short positions last year in Q4. In essence, trying to play defense of that prior high, as I wasn't expecting that the PBOC or the Chinese finance ministry was going to want to let this thing creep up to a fresh high. And it didn't. Uh, prices peeled back, remained relatively weak, through most of Q1, 
But as the trade narrative has, has deepened or gotten even more dark, the PBOC, the Chinese finance ministry, they haven't been as vigilant on the matter, and they've let the yuan weaken pretty massively. Uh, beyond that seven figure, made a strong run towards seven two, didn't quite get there. But uh, there was some China news in the headlines earlier today. It sounds like China's not so positive on a phase one trade deal yet. And that's brought in a strong pullback to that prior swing high. This is a little bit different than the other pairs that we that we look at on these webinars because this is a managed currency, or it's related to a managed currency at least. The onshore yuan is a managed currency. Offshore yuan tracks that. So in essence, it's de facto managed by China. Um, but with that said, it is it does have an element to float where it floats within a band set by the PBOC. Where this one becomes of interest is for those that are really, really bullish USD and didn't want to mess with any of the other setups in free against free floating currencies that we looked at today. Pullback to support at a prior zone or area of resistance marked by that 2016 swing high, which is also confluent with the 38.2% retracement of that recent bullish move that started in March. This could be of interest for those that want to look for creative ways to buy the U.S. dollar without having to take on risk against the euro or the British pound or the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc. That, my friends, is what I have on USD. I have a couple additional yen pairs here. Uh, now, I specifically left off dollar yen, and one of the reasons is I don't really know what in the world to do with this right now. Uh, as I shared last week, that my bullish bias on this was broken when prices just crushed below that swing low coming in around 108 and a quarter. Uh, support finally set in off that Fibonacci retracement around the 108 figure. And I'm going to say it again, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, bulls just pushed this right back up towards that previous two-month high. Uh, I would love to say that I caught this as support and looking to catch it at resistance, but I didn't. I was instead starting to look for resistance within the zone 108.47 to 108.70, which hasn't really played through. So dollar yen, I don't have much to work with here, but I think there are some of these themes that we can extrapolate. For example, yen weakness in a pair like euro yen. If I'm looking to get long the euro right now, I'd much prefer to do that against the Japanese yen than euro dollar. And I had shared this in an article earlier this week. Give me a quick second to see if I can find this. This is in the euro forecast for this week. Euro dollar so close to that longer term resistance. Uh, there just wasn't a lot on the upside there for me. But euro yen, however, is in essence built into a range after a really strong topside pop. All right, there we go. Give me a second. I'm going to see if I can find that forecast for you. The text largely still apply because the range in Euro Yen is basically just held. Um, but in this type of scenario, I can in essence take in standardized range trading logic. I'm going to buy support, sell resistance. And I could utilize a trend side or a prior trend side bias. What that means is I'm looking to buy support. like so, and correspondingly looking to sell at resistance, but not open shorts, looking to close off longs at resistance. There we go. And I even have the option, I don't have to close the whole position at or around resistance. I'll close a part of the position, stop the break even, and then look for the top side breakout thereafter. So that way, if we do get this continuation of risk uh, or a continued risk run, then I still have something that could play with that, that weak yin component in the pair. In essence, just trading a range with the trend side bias. Where I'm looking to buy a support, close a resistance, Maybe even keeping a piece of the position open in case I could get that topside breakout potential. But not looking to trigger fresh shorts, at least until prices break down below support, indicating that we're going to see more of that prior bullish move clawed back, taken out. A uh, similar type of backdrop exists in pound yen, albeit we have the, the asterisk of a much stronger British pound of recent than what's shown in the euro. But similarly, you can see where a, a a range mean reversion type of setup has built in over the past week, we can change. 
you can simply look for prices to pull back, look to buy support, close at resistance, play for breakout on the remainder of the logic. That's what I want to do with these yen pairs right now. Uh, away from dollar yen, that is. Because I don't really have much of a read on dollar yen at all right now. Okay, um, moving on. S&P 500. We've finally seen some pullback in that that beastly theme um, so far today. And again, I think this is brought upon by that headline out of the uh, South China Morning Post indicating that China isn't quite yet ready for a trade deal yet. But that bullish theme really got ahead of itself after FOMC and then NFP. I think, I mean, it felt like one of those Goldilocks type of backdrops where we're getting positive items on the trade front. We're getting positive items on the monetary front. So there's just a lot of reasons for bulls to rush in here. Um, uh, like it's going out of style, like we're at a Black Friday sale or something. Uh, so there's not a lot for me to do up here at current levels. But there's an interesting area to investigate for pullback around 3056, quick swing high uh, that came in around FOMC. A little bit deeper around 3026, that's the prior all-time high that gave a bunch of lower highs before the current breakout began. And then a little bit deeper around the 3K psychological level. If any of those are tested, topside swings can come back into order. If we break back below the 3K level, something likely has shifted, and that's the point to be prudent, patient, cautious even. But price action has absolutely blown through the top side of this rising wedge formation. So it doesn't look like a bearish breakout or bearish breakout potential is brewing at this point. I want to look for bullish continuation until that's negated. And at this point, about the best case I have for negation of that theme is, is a break back below the 3K psychological level. Gold. Okay, so gold is real interesting. Uh, we have that longer term bullish backdrop, that longer term bull flag formation. And it looked as though the stage was set for a breakout last week. I mean, heck, it, prices even postured into a breakout, but we didn't quite take out that prior swing high. We just oscillated with support showing around that 1509 Fibonacci level. And prices have absolutely folded earlier today, pushing right back to that support zone that we've been following around the 1475 to 1480 figure. I think the best course of action on gold at the moment is to take a shorter term look or a shorter term approach. In essence, something we've already looked at a couple of times in this webinar, trading the range. It's very, very simple to dice this up on a two hour chart right now, where we've in essence seen gold prices mean reverting. We're currently testing in that support zone. Continue to hold above that 1474 swing low, keeps the door for top side. In essence, range continuation. Uh, possibility for nearby targets around the 1496 to 1500 level. Stop could go to break even, and then look for prices to veer back towards 1509 to 1515. Similarly, the possibility of playing that range with the prior trend side bias, it still exists where you don't necessarily have to trigger fresh shorts when prices get up to resistance. You could scale off the longs and then look for breakout potential on the remainder of the position. The gold has gotten pretty oversold right now. And this is not the area where I'd want to look for short side exposure in a previously very strong bullish move. All right, last but certainly not least, oil. I still like oil on the short side. Um, I got caught last week trying to catch this bear flag break, and the uh, same setup still applies. We're longer term. We have these two really big zones that are just kind of lurking there, waiting for that next test. Um, but after the, after that test faltered in early October, prices have basically been channeling higher in oil with a recent resistance test of a big level around 57 and a half. As I've shared before, I think there's a couple of different interesting ways of playing bear flag breaks. Uh, one, of course, is waiting for the flag to break, pull back to resistance of prior support, and then look for it to continue. That did not work. Prices broke right back up within that bullish channel. The other way is to try to preempt the flag break or try to preempt the breakdown, which is what we might have on the cards right now. Look for resistance to hold around that 57.50 level, the same level that came into play yesterday to help hold the highs. 
And then in essence, looking to factor that down to an initial push to uh, initial push of support around 56 and a third, after which 55, 57 becomes a secondary target. After which I could then look for that 54, 56 to 55 zone to come into play. And if we could take those three out, fantastic. Focuses then on that swing low. And then looking for that continuation of the flag break. Trade it inside, trade it outside. Either way, keep risk light because you never know when one of these things is going to snap back. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Don't hesitate to let me know what's on your mind. Uh, from Quran, dollar Swiss, please. Um, so went over that. I'll do something a little bit deeper here. I think that... The most interesting thing that I have on dollar Swiss is just that it's been a fairly consistent range, even when the U.S. dollar has been pretty chaotic. We had that Q4 breakdown. So pretty much throughout October, the USD was really, really very weak. The Swiss, he's stuck within about 150 pip range for most of that time. Um, that resistance flexed in really strong at the beginning of Q4. Right back down to that support that held the lows in, in uh, late September. It could be a case to be made for breakdown potential is given these lower highs, but I don't really have that at work right now. I'm just continue to play mean reversion, mean reversion or just range continuation. <laughs> From Quran, cable looks horrid. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not a. It's not a great trend to work with or a great near-term trend to work with after that 130 figure came into play, that's for sure. It looks like it's trying to give some bull pennant type of action up here. A bit of collection after a big figure came into play. A decent level of support showed in around 128. And I'm basically just playing in between the cracks right now, trying to preempt that next 130 test. Uh, from Pete, awesome look at the majors as always, James. I like the SNR scenario with Swissy. A range is a range. Thank you, sir. I think the range is probably the most underloved, underappreciated market condition that's out there. Because, sure, top end profit potential from the range itself is often capped, right? Because if I'm looking at like Swissy, for instance, I was lining this up at 98.50, now it's up towards 99.50, 100 pips. How much more can I look for, right? Swissy in particular is especially unattractive because it's hard to imagine what's going to push this over parity, at least for long. All right, we got over parity in early October. That's when the U.S. dollar was really strong, fresh two-year highs. But even when we had that come into play in early October, I mean, dollar Swiss bulls were running out of gas. Um, but... You know, like I've mentioned on these webinars before, news can help, news can hurt, and it's absolutely unpredictable is what the future is going to hold. So with many of these ranges, I go in with a prior trend side bias to see if I can get that breakout potential on the retest of resistance. Uh, Swissy, again, a little different because I'm not too positive on pushes above parity. Um, but the most beautiful part of the range is the consistency makes my life just super, super simple because I don't have to wonder where I need to put those stops. I know where to put the stops. It's very clear and apparent. And if price breaks down, breaks through that stop, then the range that I was looking for, it no longer applies. So that conditional statement of if range holds, support remains respected, violated, get me out. It's one of those things where uh, the, I think the older I, I've gotten in my life, the more I've appreciated just brutal honesty from others because I don't have to wonder what's the message behind the message. I don't have to play any games. I know what that person's trying to say. So even if it's something that might hurt my feelings right off the bat, at least they're straight up with me and I know exactly where they're at, where they're coming from and what motivates them. I think it's a similar type of thing with ranges. They're not so pretty because they, they don't have those, you know, big picture thesis that we could dream on of like, oh yeah, sure, Euro dollar to 150. You know, you can't really plot that with a range. I'm looking for mean reversion. I'm looking for I'm looking for the average to hold. Um, but that's why I love ranges, especially if I can find a short-term range and a longer-term trend. Something I could pick on. Uh, from Quran, please explain mean reverting. Mean reverting uh, reverts back to the mean. 
back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so when you hear me say mean reversion, I'm often talking range. Right? I think that recent one that we've had in uh, gold is a good example. Price have a tendency to try to mean revert or to revert to the mean. Uh, from Quran, Nasi Yen looked interesting. Don't know where to from here, though. Yeah, I was testing a big level of resistance. I think this is pretty interesting as like a, a short risk setup. Like uh, this would be something that I would keep on the radar if I wanted to short stocks, but I didn't want to take on the exposure of the S&P 500 and the S&P few contract. Um, just did break out to a fresh eye. I've had that yen weakness playing through. But draw this back on like a daily chart. And we're testing a pretty big area of resistance around 75 and a quarter. You know, and this is after that 75 and a quarter level had already come in as resistance. There's a big figure there. Uh, this is something I would definitely not want to chase, but something I could keep on the radar for fades, for sure. Let me see if I have a cleaner setup here elsewhere. Yep, we're still within the danger zone. See, so yeah, I think this one will be, you know, a pretty attractive counterbalance or, or, or a counter option for uh, short side equity plays at the moment. Aha, my man Pete, seeing around that next corner. I like it. Um, points out, and I think we're on the hourly or the two hour gold chart. Yeah. Around like the two hour gold chart. Now, RSI sure hit a low, even with gold still in the same range. Divergence, my friend. Divergence. It's beautiful when it pops up, but that's one of the reasons that I keep RSI on my, on my radar. Um, it's not for catching bullish swings or bullish signals or whatever, it's for the deductive signals that it shows whenever prices are diverging or when there is that massive case of divergence, when selling pressure aggressively runs into a big long-term level or zone of support, maybe opening the door for some asymmetric risk reward ratios. Pretty attractive when it happens. You know, and I, I've said this multiple times in the past few months on gold in particular, because, you know, it's one of those things where human sentiment or human behavior really kind of works at a disservice or for as a disservice to the trader. Because, you know, the reality is that most people don't want to get long gold unless it's showing one of these big blue bars, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Something's going up. People want to buy it. Motion creates emotion, and the power of crowds comes into play, right? But if it's a bullish theme, this is the type of thing you want to see where it builds into a range, prices digest, collect. You find an equalization of buyers and sellers in a relatively small area on the chart. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to go up from here, but it does mean if if we were seeing some continued pullback from folks that were long, looking to close off their positions as that bullish trend has stalled or stopped or slowed down, um, that could be a strong explanation for why we're seeing this grind in price action of recent. So I like these conditions, and I think it's one of the reasons to keep an eye or keep a focus on longer-term charts because, you know, the reality is that range we've seen over the past few weeks is just a drop in the bucket. Now, granted, the pullback in gold so far has been relatively minor. I think we were looking at like a 23.6 pullback to that low that came into play in September. So, I mean, there could be scope for more, but from a timing perspective, buyers are still coming in to support the bid. Enough motive to keep this on the long side of my radar, at least. Uh, for Pete, I said this on Thursday, too. 98.50, 99.50 range. All else is noise until the confirmed break. Yeah, I like, I like it. Captain consistency when we can get it, right? And that's what those ranges can offer. Uh, Kiwi dollar, if time permits. I have... I don't have a great feel on Kiwi right now. I have a couple of levels or possible levels that I might be able to work with. Uh, that level just came into play a little earlier this morning. That's a longer term Fibonacci retracement. Let me a quick second so I can jog my memory as to exactly where it comes from. Yeah, so it's the 2000 low up to that double top that printed in 2011 and then again in 2014. It's the 50 fib of that move. It's right in play right now 
All right, we perched down there a little earlier this morning, brought some buyers into the mix. But like I said, I don't really have a great feel for it because it looked like we were getting a bullish theme coming right back. Now it's snapped back, lower low, lower high, another lower low. I mean, so I could cut this one in either way. It just depends on just depends on how I want to position around the US dollar right now. I think more attractively topside swings could be in order, stops below that low. I mean, because that, that that swing low is so so nearby. Uh, so I could really squeeze the risk and likely clear off better than one one. Yeah, like 64 and a quarter is like 40 pips away. You know, so if I had to pick something, I'd, I'd probably, probably be focusing on that side. I'm looking to play top side swings after support inflection uh, from a long-term Fibonacci level that had previously given a pretty, pretty decent dose of resistance. Uh, from Kron, uh, Swiss E 9940 was level I was watching for it to go to. May not do it, don't know. Yeah, this thing has been pulsing throughout the webinar. I've been trying to get a good read on, on short-term price action here, but I mean, it, it's not really showing pinches of a pullback right now. I mean, 9940 is just like six pips off. I think we could get that by the end of the webinar. And what happens after that? That's the big question because 9950 has been a pretty tricky level here. I'm at a pretty, pretty tricky level here. I mean, so at this stage, I basically needed to pull back before I'd be able to, to take on any more long exposure on this one. Uh, for Pete, if anything, Swiss looks to be forming a descending wedge. Yeah, it's got qualities of that in there, but, you know, there wasn't a real clean inflection off of this trend line. And I'm just, in general, a kind of a stickler on my trend lines. If I want to chart something up as a descending wedge or descending triangle, uh, I really want to see that third test uh, really respected, which we didn't really get here. You know, so I, I'm not putting a lot of weight in that trend line. I just kept it on the chart to see if the projection caught the highs, which so far it has. Um, you know, so if, like, let's just say, for instance, right now, we caught the exact high on dollar Swiss and prices turn around. So I just get that that kiss off the trend line projection right there. Now I can start to actually give some weight because we had you know, this incident right in here, well, there's some pretty good symmetry in these highs. As in, like, I could put it just, like, right at that swing high right there. And now it's got that one perfectly, right? If it holds this one, then I can say, okay, well, now I got my third test. There's something here. It's not just me connected two dots on the chart and hoping that it works out. But I wouldn't want to put a lot of weight in that yet because at this point, all that I really have are those two touches with a breach, you know, and I don't know if that's what turned around the advance. I wouldn't want to put too much weight in it yet. Uh, from Pete, possible breakup to 100 if Greenback keeps it up. Yeah, I mean, anything's possible for sure, um, especially in the environment that we have right now because these central banks are really, really – I don't want to say sounding desperate, but, you know, there's – and we'll hear from the BOE on Thursday. We haven't had a super Thursday from them since the Brexit breakthrough or the, the positive developments of Brexit. So um, – but I don't think there's many central banks that are actively looking to hike right now. So the simple fact that the Fed's not looking to cut, I mean, it could expose the dollar to that uh, term that I've used before, those ill-gotten gains, even though the Fed's not looking to hike. All right, got to take the last couple questions of the day. Uh, from Karan, DXY, I think I missed the beginning. Were you saying that you're more favorable of shorts off current levels? If so, what target levels are you looking at, please? Yeah, just in absentia uh, on DXY, I prefer shorts versus longs. Uh, largely on the basis of the rising wedge break, the fresh two-month low that was set a couple weeks ago, tested again last Friday. Uh, and as it's looking to fade off this excitement that's shown up so far today, uh, as far as levels to break it down to, there's a pretty attractive swing around 97.50, and then we have the two-month low, 97.15. Below that, 96.47 is a really big level for me. Uh, Longer-term FIB level, it's been in play a couple of different times over the past year, uh, a couple of different iterations. There we go. Uh, helping to hold highs. We're coming in around resistance, follow through support, resistance. 
good basis level right there. You know, prices broke below, then came right back. And that was kind of like the delineating line between uh, extreme sell-off and, and reversal. 9647 would be the next uh, next level beyond 9715 that I look for prices to move towards. Okay, last comment question of the day. All right, so it looks like the, the big kind of prevailing theme here is gold and timing that that uh, that uptrend. So bull and bear flags are one of those formations that I think have a tendency to show traps just because they're they're so widely followed, right? Like if we think about what goes into a trend, it's largely sentiment and mood, right? Like for instance, um, when gold was initially playing out that bullish theme Q4 last year, and, and if you remember the way that that went down, it was the opening days of Q4, Jerome Powell says the neutral rate is a long way off, inferred to mean that the Fed had plans for many more rate hikes in 2019. In short order, stocks tipped over, Risk aversion became the name of the game very quickly. You can even see where gold prices start to spike. Higher high, higher low. By the time we get to the December rate decision, gold prices are already at like five month highs. That breakout continued into 2019 trade. And then as we started to hear the Fed shuffle back on those hawkish claims, and that's when gold really started to break out. When we got into mid-February, gold had already begun to test these 2018 swing highs. And this was at a really big zone of resistance that we looked at here in these webinars. It runs between around 1350 up around 1375. Buyers just were not able to climb that mountain though. And then this doesn't necessarily mean the backdrop around gold wasn't as bullish. It had just went so far so fast that anybody that did want to buy was already long. And in some cases, and then some, because they could lever in this market. And so that's what led to a very garden variety pullback. Lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high. And that built into this little falling wedge formation. And this is kind of similar, or can be kind of similar to a bull flag. And then it can be approached as a continuation formation, particularly when we're in the midst of higher highs and higher lows. The gold prices took like a three month pause right in here from February to May not making any fresh highs lower highs lower lows and again i mean i remember setting these webinars talking about this trying to plot this off of that support but what ultimately ended up happening is the support level that built in around 1267 right in here All right we caught this higher low and then another higher low and then Boom goes the dynamite. Now that was right around a Jerome Powell comment in early June when he started finally opened the door for rate cuts. And that's when gold finally broke through that resistance, higher low, higher high, and that theme continued all the way into July. And even thereafter, even as we saw the Fed continue to cut or continue to talk up hawkish policy, that bullish theme in gold prices very much continued. Uh, so at this stage, the bull flag in gold is a couple months old. But that digestion, it can certainly continue. What I'm doing right now is the same thing I was doing right back here, which is trying to preempt that bullish theme that I think is coming around the next corner by looking to treat current market conditions with a top side or, or a one-sided type of bias. Uh, counter opinion here, um, waiting for 1425 to 1450. Sure, that could definitely come in because think about what keeps these types of themes running. It's usually some element of uh, uh, longer term bulls, trailing stops, expecting that, 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 that run to continue. And so as we get these support breaks, similar to what happened here at like 1483, when we get those support breaks, it could run for a while because if there's a bunch of stops, say, setting at 1473, stops on long positions, well, what is that? And that means a bunch of orders to sell. So once we trigger through that low, a cascade of orders comes into the market to sell off of those stops, which creates further downside move. 
So it's something like that's definitely possible. The risk in looking for support that deep is that it might not come into play, which is why I'm trying to preempt this by trading the range with the prior trend side bias. And if it breaks support, I'll take the stop. I'm going to look to do the same thing a little bit deeper. But that, my friends, is what I have for today. And uh, we'll end it with, with Pete's comment here, straight up market pressure. Yes, sir. Can happen in a blink. The old saying goes up the stairs, down the elevator, and the explanation I just gave you is why. Because <laughs> uh, folks are far more motivated by fear than they are greed. Greed is incremental. Greed is something where you're willing to dip your toe in the water a little bit deeper. Fear is something where you just jump, try to get out of the way. But thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day, and as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.